Good morning, everyone. Good to be with you again on Facebook Live on this Tuesday, April the 7th, as we continue to uh, gather together virtually on mornings, usually between 9 and 10, 10.30, somewhere around there is always my goal. This morning, I'm a little bit later than I anticipated. I had a, a Zoom uh, video meeting with the bishop earlier today, and um, it was good to see Bishop Scholl and hear that uh, he's doing well and his, his family as well, and they are, uh, they are continuing to, um, to get through this uh, time of challenge that we're all getting through. So he sends his greetings to uh, all friends and members of uh, First UMC in Morristown. So he says hello. Um, today we're going to be uh, going in a different direction. Uh, we're switching gears in the Gospel of John, and we'll get to that in just a moment, but I just want to uh, encourage you all again to uh, stay safe, continue to shelter in place if you, um, unless you need to go out absolutely for anything essential, uh, but try to stay home. That's always good advice for everyone. And uh, we're getting used to this, I think, a little bit, and maybe that's a good thing. Uh, we're finding inventive ways to connect with one another. I actually had an opportunity to send out another recorded message to some of our, I assume, some of our older folks in the church. It's a list of about 50 people or so who just don't use email, perhaps don't even have computers. So it's hard for them to stay connected. So uh, as I mentioned, I believe last week, John Halligan found a, a wonderful service that is very inexpensive. It's only four cents per call where I can record up to a two minute message and uh, send it out to those folks uh, automatically over uh, or a telephone. So they'll get a phone call and I recorded something and they'll hear a recorded message from me and I, I include uh, scripture or um, uh, words of encouragement, uh, some updates about what's happening in the church and just an invitation if they need any help we can likely help out in the church office. So um, Good to see you joining this morning Tracy again. You were first on today and uh, Mr. Blizzard good seeing you. Uh, Marilyn hope you're doing well today. And good morning, uh, Cindy, good to see you. Uh, Kenny is on this morning, and Mary, good to see you guys too. And Sue Mitchell, good to see you, Sue. Hope you're doing well also, and best to Lindsay this morning as well. Um, you know, it's funny, you, you keep busy during this time, and you continue to do some different things. Maybe, uh, you know, you're spending time with family, perhaps, I hope, and uh, it does create an opportunity to spend more time with family than otherwise you would have the opportunity to um, under normal circumstances. So I hope you're really taking advantage of that. Um, good morning, Peter. Good to see you. I assume you're in Florida. I think you're in Florida, as I recall, but it's good to see you online this morning. Join in, in for this Facebook Live um, chat this morning. Um, another good thing uh, that can come out of this as well, including uh, being with family, is to maybe catch up on some reading. Maybe you've had a chance to do that also. Um, when you don't go too many places, you don't travel, uh, it's interesting the things that you can uh, figure out uh, and, and try. Uh, so I'm, like I'm reading a book, for instance, that I had picked up. And um, so you know, I, I love history and I studied history in college and it's one of my uh, one things I really like to, to read. So I don't get a chance to read too much anymore of things outside of church and theology and so forth. So I picked up uh, this book and I started reading it. It's called A History of Slovakia. Thrilling, right? I know you're excited. I will lend it to anyone who wants to read it when I'm done. I'm sure you would love that. <laughs> this is the type of stuff I like reading though. So I learn a lot too that way. It's part of the world I don't know a lot about. So I'm picking up on that. Um, good morning, Karen. Good to see you on as well this morning. Hope you're doing well today. And uh, this is a good day, good start to your day. So that's where we're at. Oh, and I want to mention one other thing. Uh, beginning either this afternoon or tomorrow, um, in the afternoon, not in the morning, but in the afternoon, I'm going to come on Facebook Live again during this week, and I'm going to gear a message towards uh, the children, uh, children of the church, grandchildren, anyone who wants to um, come come on live or uh, you can watch it recorded on Facebook as well. I'll be doing that in the afternoons. I'm not sure of the time yet, but I'm going to do it every day between now and, uh, and Easter. And what I'm going to do with them 
is I'm going to go through, maybe many of you have probably seen this, these are resurrection eggs, they're called. Um, they tell the story of Holy Week by using eggs, which is a common theme for Easter. And so, for instance, I'll just give you a quick example here. Um, the first one, the first egg, the light blue egg, or the, actually the blue egg, has in it a donkey. And we know how the donkey feel, uh, fits into the story of, of Holy Week. And there's 12 eggs and it tells the whole story, so I'm going to be doing that. As I said, probably this afternoon or tomorrow afternoon I'll start and uh, invite the kids to join in and, and see, what's, uh, see what that's all about this week as we continue to go through Holy Week. So, uh, Mary, good to see you uh, joining in this morning. And Linda, you're back with us as well. I don't have my Phillies hat on today. Um, I just have on a soccer jersey, basically, but no. Uh, it is green, though, so I'm getting better, right? <laughs> closer, closer to Eagles colors. Um, so as we continue through the Gospel of John, remember Jesus, in the fifth chapter, had uh, been in Jerusalem, and he had gone to Jerusalem for a festival. He had gone from Galilee to Jerusalem for a festival. And we uh, kind of surmised, and scholars have surmised, that that was the festival of Pentecost. And he performed uh, another sign there, another sign with the healing of the man by the Sheepgate Pool, the paralyzed man. Uh, and then, and he did this on the Sabbath, of course. And then we had this whole discussion yesterday about how um, at, towards the end of this chapter, Jesus starts to talk in this long discourse about the Trinitarian formula. This is the introduction of the idea of the Trinity in the Gospel of John and the Son's relationship with the Father. And uh, we talked about that quite at length uh, yesterday. So now we get to chapter 6, and it's interesting how chapter 6 starts, because remember, Jesus was in Jerusalem for the festival of Pentecost. We we think that was the case. We know he was in Jerusalem, as Scripture says, but didn't say which festival. We think it's Pentecost. And his discourse on this uh, relationship between Son and Father, the Trinitarian thing that we just talked about, um, took place also in Jerusalem. So he's been in Jerusalem for all of chapter 5, right? He was in Galilee before that. Now he's in Jerusalem. Chapter 6 starts out like this, which is really interesting. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. That's problematic, isn't it? If Jesus was just in Jerusalem, how did all of a sudden he get to the Sea of, of Galilee in chapter 6? After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. It's almost like chapter 6 is out of order in some ways, or chapter 5 is out of order. Something is not right here in the way the gospel has been put together. So, uh, the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So, that's, that creates some, uh, some problems. John, the author, refers to the Sea of Galilee as the Sea of Tiberias. This is the only gospel that refers to the Sea of Galilee in this way, as the Sea of uh, Tiberias as well, which actually makes some sense and lends to John's understanding of the area because the city uh, of uh, the town of Tiberias was built in the mid-20s uh, AD uh, by Herod, and it was on the southwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And the name eventually became associated, the name of the town Tiberias eventually did become associated with the Sea of Galilee as well. So it was, it was called the Sea of Tiberias, according to other sources. So John knows what he's talking about here when he refers to it also as the Sea of, of Tiberias, which is, uh, is interesting. So that's verse 1. Then verse 2 continues. So we don't know how Jesus gets to Galilee, but something's happening here. A large crowd kept following him because the, they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. So we have a reference to other signs mentioned here. Um, perhaps they're the signs that we've heard about. Now, remember, this is Galilee, and the previous sign took place in Jerusalem, so it couldn't have been that one. We have the healing of the official son, which takes place in Galilee, and also the miracle at Cana, the wedding at Cana, also takes place in, in Galilee. So maybe those are the signs that the broadcast has been paused. I think I'm back now. Am I back? Okay, good. Uh, I'll take this moment to say hi to other folks. Bobby, I see you're on. Um, Debbie, 
you see you're, you're on as well. Chris, good to see you too. Hope you're doing well. And uh, Max, you're back on also. Good. Good to see you. So I was, I was just saying that in verse 3 then, it says, Jesus went up to the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. What mountain are we talking about? It's the other side of the Sea of Galilee. But this could not necessarily be a mountain. The, the Greek word could simply mean a, the hill country or a higher ground. Okay, So the Sea of Galilee may have been lower, um, but there may have been higher ground on the other side. So it's not necessarily a mountain as we think of a mountain. It could be just higher ground that John is referring to here. Um, this area we know very well from uh, recent history, history unfortunately of uh, the conflict between Israelis and the surrounding uh, nations, uh, particularly Syria in this case, but this is the Golan Heights that we're talking about. The general area of the Golan Heights is what we're, is what's being referred to here. So you actually know where this uh, is taking place. And then in verse 4 as we continue now, the Passover the festival of the Jews was near. So Jesus in Galilee, but the Passover is being mentioned here. This is interesting too, because again, remember I said chapter six seems kind of out of order. How did Jesus suddenly arrive in Galilee when he was just in Jerusalem? So if in Jerusalem, he was there for the festival of Pentecost, and now John is saying that this is that when this is taking place, the feeding miracle, the feeding of the 5,000, if this is taking place around the time of the Passover, a whole year would have passed. A whole year would have gone by uh, until this took place. All right. So um, again, chapter 6 of John just doesn't strike as being in the right, doesn't strike us as being in the right place. It's almost like something is out of order here. And scholars have come up with whole sorts of inventive um, ideas about how this may have taken place. One in particular, the great German scholar Rudolf Bultmann um, thought that maybe John was writing this gospel and um, wouldn't exactly happen this, happen this way, but you can picture that a big wind came by and blew the papers all over the place and, and uh, the author John had to pick them up and put them back together and he might have messed up putting them back together. <laughs> I mean, that's, these are the type of inventive things that scholars think about. We really don't know what happened here. I have an idea of what happened. Um, and, and it does have to do with the sign source that John probably used to put together his gospel. But that's for a different day. So let's continue. So the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw the large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? Um, he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. So Jesus is kind of... Uh, playing some games here with Philip. And Philip answered him, six months wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. So we're talking about a lot of people here. A lot of people gathered, a large crowd. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, hey, look, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what, what are they among so many people? Jesus said in verse 10 now, make the people sit down. Now, there was a great deal of grass in the place. So they sat down about 5,000 in all. And as we hear also in the Synoptic Gospels, 5,000 would have referred to um, just the men in the group. So that would not count women and children. So that's uh, it's a large crowd we're talking about, okay? Um, so another interesting part about verse 10, which we may want to spend a, just a moment on, um, is this reference to the grass, okay? Verse 10, again, I'll read it for you, says this. Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place. So they sat down about 5,000 in all. So Jesus has them sit down in grass. Scrub grass would be what this area probably would have been like, kind of a deserted um, area, kind of barren in some ways, so there would be some cover, but it would probably be sort of brownish, um, scrub grass, as I say. This is a story that appears in all four Gospels, as we said before, in the Synoptics, and especially in Mark's Gospel. If we read the version from Mark, and if you're interested, you could see this in Mark chapter 6. The same story is, is told by Mark. But Mark adds a little detail here, or there's a little detail in Mark that's not in John. And it takes place in the 39th verse in Mark chapter 6. 
I'll back up a little bit and read some from Mark here. And he said to them, how many loaves have you? Go and see. When they had found out, they said, five and two fish. Five loaves and two fish, right? Makes sense? Then he ordered them, this is Jesus, then he ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass. The reference is green grass in Mark. Not just grass, but green grass. As we said before, this area that we're talking about, a deserted place, likely didn't have green grass. This Golan Heights area would have been much more sparse and, as I said, kind of like scrub grass. So John's version sounds much more uh, in tune with what we would find in that area. The grass, not the green grass. So why does Mark add the phrase green if that's what happened? Why would he do that? What we find in, and this is a longer discussion, but what we find in John versus what we find in Mark sometimes is at odds. Another story, not a miracle story, but another story that we find common to all four of the Gospels is the anointing stories, okay? Um, the woman who comes to Jesus, and she's described in different ways in the different Gospels, but um, the common factor is that this woman anoints Jesus with what's called spikenard, okay? And we'll get to this later. It comes in uh, later on in the Gospel of John, but nard, spike nard, like a perfume type of thing, and an abundance of it too is what the Gospels remember. Now in John's Gospel, this woman anoints Jesus' feet, as is the case in Luke, right? She anoints Jesus' feet with this, this nard. Um, in Mark's Gospel, the woman anoints his head. His head is anointed. Interesting. Same story, but in Mark's version, it's the head of Jesus that's anointed. In John's version, it's the feet of Jesus that's anointed. Why the difference, I wonder, right? Two separate events? Yeah, maybe, but the similarities are very compelling to think that this is just the same incident. Where do we hear in the Bible, in a very, very famous, famous part of the Bible, where do we hear about heads being anointed and green grass? Where do we hear that? Think about that. Does anyone in the audience out there know where that takes place? Very famous. Probably one of the most famous, and it's, I'll say it's in the New Testament, so you, I mean the Old Testament, so you know that. Where does that happen? Green grass or green pastures and anointing of the head. It's the 23rd Psalm, isn't it? Think about it, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Bobby's got it. That's right. Bobby's got it. Green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. What miracle comes after this in John's gospel? The calming of the storm. The calming of the storm, right? It sounds an awful lot like the 23rd Psalm. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths, uh, in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. Prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. What comes next? You anoint my head with oil, just like Mark's gospel. What is going on here? That these stories are different, and it seems like Mark is following some parts of the 23rd Psalm and telling the story of Jesus, whereas John doesn't. I will leave you to think about that uh, some more, but... Um, I have my ideas of what might be going on here as well. But it's an interesting little tidbit of information from biblical studies and, and what scholars like to talk about when they compare versions of the gospel. So let's continue from here and uh, see what happens next. So in John, we're back to John now, uh, Jesus makes them sit down in the grass and they sit down about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves which he had given thanks I'm sorry, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. That's verse 11. There are really a lot of similarities with the various accounts of the Last Supper, right, with this particular miracle as John describes it. Um, he took loaves, right? We hear the description of the Last Supper um, where Jesus does that. He took loaves. We still say that when we do communion now, right? He gave thanks. Same thing in the communion ritual, same thing in 
other versions of the Last Supper or versions of the Last Supper in, um, in the Gospels. And he distributed them. He gave them out. Those three elements are present here as well as in the accounts of the Last Supper in the Synoptic Gospels. Interesting. So John is uh, either feeding into a tradition here or his source is feeding into a tradition which uh, talks about and remembers when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper as well. So, distributed the bread, also the fish. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. Okay, gather up the fragments so that nothing may be lost. Um, and then verse 13, so they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. 12 baskets. And here's the, the miracle. Here's the sign that the story refers to. Um, just the bread is mentioned here, not the fish. So the emphasis on, on the bread may be something important to, uh, to highlight. Um, and maybe it has to do what Jesus is going to talk about uh, later on in this chapter, having to do and having to identify himself with the bread of life. So John may be wanting to, or Jesus may be wanting to identify here uh, or highlight here just the, the bread in, in the gathering up of the bread so that he can identify later as uh, the bread of life. When the people saw the sign that he had done, there's that word again, Simeon, the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. And it, the expectation, the messianic expectation, often was a, described as a prophet like Moses. Okay, So this might be what the crowd was, was talking, talking about. But again, this is a sign. And again, we're talking about perhaps a source that John had in front of him, the Book of Signs. So we... Uh, we identify this as one of the signs, perhaps, and it would have been, it's the fourth sign now that we've uh, come across in the Gospel of John. So that ends that account, and Jesus now in verse 15 realizes that they were about to come and take him by force and make him king. Interesting, right? Make him king. So they wanted to grab him, I guess, and, and force him to be a king because of these signs that he's performing. So his hour has not yet come, as we've heard before, so he withdraws again uh, to the mountain by himself. So he leaves that area, it says, and withdraws uh, to the mountain. Uh, we will end there for today, because Jesus is going to be going into another sign or another uh, miracle, walking on the water, which is also attested to in the other Gospels. And um, we'll talk about that. Uh, tomorrow. I see there's some uh, questions here. Bob, good to see you uh, on uh, this morning as well. Hope everyone is well in your family. Um, Tracy, you ask a good question. Could it be uh, that the bread is a symbol for himself and uh, he will still be uh, around until the crucifixion? Very possibly, yeah. Anything is open to interpretation here. Um, it's a wonderful thing about the Gospels. They don't always give us the interpretive answers that we're looking for, so we have to dig deeper and and look into um, look into the uh, the evidence and and the various sources that we think the gospel writers used. Also, of course, the Hebrew scriptures, which they were very familiar with as well. So um, that's very possible, and that's a good question that you ask. So until then, tomorrow, friends, we'll continue with verse sixteen. Um, as I said, I hope to be back this afternoon and do a couple of those resurrection eggs with uh, the kids. Um, probably, I don't know of a time right now. I know I have another call. I have to go on later. So I'm, I'm thinking like two o'clock, somewhere around there. I might target two, three, somewhere around there, but it'll be on Facebook live and it will remain on there too. So you can watch it even though it's recorded. So if you want to gather kids, grandkids, as we uh, go through Holy week and we'll go through the resurrection eggs, uh, for the days this week leading to Easter. Everyone have a great day today. Stay safe, please stay inside unless you absolutely have to go out. Um, we're arriving at uh, the peak of this, they tell us, uh, within a week or two. Uh, we'll see how that goes, but uh, now is the time really to be vigilant and stay safe. So God bless everyone, and uh, we will talk to you soon. Bye.